This Merton 1942 piece is the most influential discussion of the ethos of scientific research, what the norms and the culture of scientific researchers um, is. It's been cited you know, many thousands of times. Merton was a sociologist, and he really grounds his view on what's, of, of what scientists do in um, a set of social structures and a social system, which I guess makes sense given his, um, his field. He goes through and discusses these norms and I think has a pretty interesting take on how researchers view these norms. They're, they're, researchers view the norms of science not just as being good for the production of knowledge, not just being sort of efficient in some sense or you know, instrumentally useful, but as being morally right. There's a sort of sense of right and wrong. Um, really, there's ethics to research. Um, now, what was very interesting for me in reading this and just sort of learning more about this area is I, I, in graduate school, was never taught anything about the ethics of research. I never had a course on it. I think you just sort of maybe pick it up from your advisor or it's sort of like floating in the air. Um, so, but, but yet, you know, I think a, a lot of what they identify really is um, something that we all feel or many of us feel. Um, and these are the four values. There's universalism. I'm going to go through these in a sec. Universalism is a core value of scientific research, communality, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. So I'll go through those. Universalism, the validity of a claim that's made should not rest on who's making it. So if I'm a powerful person and I think the world is flat, it doesn't matter because we can objectively show scientifically that it's round. And so even if someone famous or rich or powerful says the wrong thing, science can sort of prove them wrong. Whereas in many other parts of life, you know, the rich and the powerful really do have control over reality or what's true or what's said or what can be said. So, um, you know, there's nothing about your status in society that should matter. And Merton makes some, you know, interesting points when a scientific institution is embedded in a society that doesn't have a universalist ideal, there's a just fundamental strain or fundamental tension um, that Merton argues and others have argued might actually hinder the advancement of society. Um, there's also, you know, to the extent that we think anybody can contribute to science and not only people coming from a certain background, then uh, again, there's a notion that equality of opportunity may be the, the right thing in order to advance science, right? Because everybody could make some sort of contribution. So many scholars, and, and Merton cites some of them, and there's a big literature on this, have made the link between democracy and scientific progress. And this is contested, but the notion is in an open society where people can debate ideas and anybody can go and sort of uh, try to advance knowledge, you're actually going to have more scientific progress than in a totalitarian society. Communality. The findings of science are meant to be common property to the scientific community. There's a notion of a scientific community that's very different than what a research community would look like in a private firm, again, where there's proprietary data and you're not supposed to share what you're learning. You're supposed to use it for your own sort of ends. Um, you know, secrecy is the antithesis of the norm. Again, this is Merton you know, 70 years ago writing about what he saw as the ideal of science. But I think many people would still subscribe to these, and I'll, I'll show you evidence on that. You know, open communication about what you're doing is what science is supposed to um, be, be about. He called it, instead of communality, he called it communism. I heard, I, that word was used in a couple other settings at the, around the same time. So we've, now people say communality. Um, so, but basically, yeah, especially in a sentence like this, yeah. Um, but basically, you know, he, he, he draws this very sharp <coughs> distinction. I mean, he's saying something that I think a lot of researchers here at Berkeley or in the Bay Area today would, would sort of you know, disagree with. But the point of Merton is in the ideal ethos of scientific research, you're not meant to develop uh, you know, ideas and turn them into private property. The whole idea is to contribute to scientific progress. So this whole push in research universities, definitely in the U.S., definitely in the Bay Area, to commercialize every half decent idea you have and you know launch a startup based on it or something like that would be seen as really antithetical to the the scientific ideal actually and early on he cites some some work on this 
and, and there's some follow-up work, but there was a lot of debate early on about whether that was even appropriate. I mean, universities in the 30s and 40s, you know, in, in those days, they didn't have offices trying to spin off technologies from their engineering departments. They weren't doing that. Now they do it. Now it's just part of the sort of money-making process in a, in a university. So anyhow, just something to think about that the, the ideal as many scientists would see it, is open sharing of information rather than trying to develop something that you then commercialize. And again, there, should, there could be very different norms for academic versus corporate uh, researchers here. And in fact, I'll, I'll mention some evidence that there are different norms in, in the next paper, the Anderson et al. Disinterestedness. Scientists should be focused on identifying the truth and not about their own advancement, not about making money. You're supposed to you know, report findings as they are, even if it's not good for your career, even if it goes against prevailing wisdom, even if it could hurt you, even if other people are mad at you. You're supposed to do it. And again, this is, uh, this is the ideal. Of course, human beings are self-interested to some extent, but academic researchers, at least, are, meant to, are supposed to be a bit less self-interested than others in their motivation. So there's actually a pretty interesting discussion here in Merton. He says... You know, people often associate all these kinds of altruistic motives to academic researchers. They have a passion for knowledge. They want to benefit humanity. They're selfless. And he sort of shoots down the notion that somehow academics are just morally different or better or something than other people. Just as they just work in a social system and under a set of institutions that make it in their interest to behave that way. So anyway, that, that's a, as you read this bit of text, something to uh, you know, keep an eye on, he basically says that we don't really have an unusual degree of moral integrity. We're just working in a system where um, that sort of honesty and clarity is rewarded. The final point is organized skepticism. So a fundamental characteristic of the ethos of a scientific researcher is they shouldn't take things at face value. They need to see a proof. I can't just tell you I have proof for Ma's last theorem. I need to prove it, right? Uh, I can't just tell you I found something. I need to sort of verify it. So again, you know, a central um, aspect of research is the scrutiny that we face. And in fact, Merton claims that actually, you know, compared to other realms of life, scientists, researchers, are su- their work is subject to far more scrutiny than almost any other field because anybody around the world can, you know, get your data if you make it available and try to you know, disprove you or claim something different than you did. And that's just part of the game. That is what we're supposed to be doing. That is the ideal. But too often, we've sort of departed from that, um, that ideal. And I'll talk about an example of that um, later on today. And then there's, you know, some of these great, you know, quotes about not respecting the cleavage between the sacred and the profane. You know, again, very uh, lofty work. Meaning scientists shouldn't restrict themselves to acceptable topics or just study what people in power think is okay. Um, They should look critically at everything and analyze everything. And that's really the ideal. And I think in some ways it's very inspiring to think of ourselves as researchers, and you guys are just getting your training now, uh, but to think of ourselves as researchers who are part of this kind of tradition of thought. You know, maybe we haven't always lived up to this ideal, but it is an ideal that we can, you know, maybe believe in. Right? So that's the, the notion of, these, uh, of, of the attraction of these norms.